tonight we're going to be talking about the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. What in the world is that? We're going to be in the book of Acts, starting in chapter 1. I'm going to be reading some scriptures in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Now, the New Testament is broken into parts, and, and it's... So I want to break it down for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the first four books of the New Testament Bible, and they are introducing the new dispensation. In other words, time as our world knew it is closing out. I mean, we're in 2023 AD or after the death of Christ. I mean, time stopped. The old covenant, the Jewish nation had not heard from God for over 400 years. And all of a sudden, this man named John starts crying, the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. He stirs up multitudes everywhere. The political leaders of the day, the um, religious leaders of the day, they all get in a tizzy, what is going on? John is saying, he's announcing that something new that God's kingdom is coming to the earth. Then you find in the book of Matthew, Mark and Luke and John, it's four different people telling their eyewitness account of Jesus. Isn't it funny that if we all see uh, something happen, we tell the story, it's the same story, it really happened, but we all see it from a different perspective. I was studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I realized that some of their characters determined how they told their story. Like John, he was always so close to Jesus that he could lay his head on his shoulder. Think about it. Luke, he was in the back of the crowd because he was a Gentile and wasn't even supposed to be in the the group of Jews at the time. So Luke, he was way back. He heard things. He couldn't hear the whispers of Jesus. He could just hear what he was blurting out. So what he heard and how he heard it was the way he heard it. So think about that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four different people, eyewitnesses of the account of Jesus, telling about the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection. Jesus kept saying, when I die, I'm going to I'm going to rise again. And because I rise again, if you believe in me, you also will rise again and live forever. And what we have here is the book of Acts. Acts means actions, actions. So those people walked, talked, lived, ate, drank with Jesus. And when he died, he gave them specific commands on what they were supposed to do. He said, greater things shall you do because I go. So Acts chapter 2 are those people and what they did. They didn't repeat what Jesus said. They fulfilled it. They did what he said. So in Acts chapter 2, it's talking, I'm going to, it says, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. This was Luke writing the book of Acts. Luke was a, a scholar. He was very educated. He was one of the most educated people. He was a physician, had a lot of education. He wrote a lot of the New Testament books uh, other than the ones that Paul, a great Jewish scholar of the day wrote. But all of the books of the Bible may have been penned by man or published by man. But the Bible says that they are clearly inspired by God himself. So Acts chapter 1 verse 2 says, Until the day in which he was taken up after that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. You know, Jesus didn't choose like a, a group of a thousand 
to change the world with this New Testament gospel that has gone all over the world. I mean, every nation on the planet has heard of Jesus. It's gone all over the world. He only used 12 men. Think about that without our technology, without microphones and speakers and PA systems. Jesus chose 12 faithful, committed men and and the world was changed with this new gospel. In verse 3, it says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. When Jesus came and was born, he was God in the flesh, and it was the kingdom of heaven joining mankind. And that's what he spoke about. That's what he shared about. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about, the kingdom of God, which is the rule of God. He came and he spoke to those 12 and showed himself alive. He showed that his hands had been pierced and he rose from the dead. So here's what happened. He came, he talked to them. And Verse 4 says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which which ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized. If you watched the last video about baptism, it means totally emerged or submerged. I mean, like... You're all in. He said, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then they go in and they ask him a question about what about the kingdom of Israel? And he didn't, he, it's the kingdom of God he was here for. And so he shut them down in verse seven when he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He's like, you know what? We're not talking about the kingdom of Israel. We're talking about the kingdom of God. But verse 8, he tells them clearly, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, once you receive this power called the Holy Ghost, you're going to witness like Jerusalem is where they were physically located at the time. He said, you're going to receive power and you're going to be a witness where you are. And then the whole world is going to know. In other words, this gospel, this light is just going to go to the whole world. It's going to start, I mean, one little light, it's going to be like shining in a dark room. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why standing you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you in heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So the angel said, You saw Jesus just rising up. Well, you know what? One day he's going to come back. The same way he's just going to come from the sky and he's just going to take his bride. So verse 13 says, and when they were come in, they went into an upper room. Now, I'm not real familiar with the architecture of houses in the Asia area. I'm used to these here in Virginia. Even Virginia houses are different than those in Arizona on the West Coast. It's all different, right? But apparently there was an upper room or there was a gathering place. It says, and uh, it says, and when they they were come and they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John, it starts to name the disciples and verse 14 says they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. Oh, the women were allowed to pray with the men. Wow. Here in America, most of the churches at the turn of the century, the women have a different entrance than the man. 
But Jesus was a great example that everywhere he was at when he walked on the earth, women came right into his presence. He would talk with them just like he did the men and the other disciples. So his disciples had watched him for three years and they saw how he treated everyone with respect. The children, he said, suffer not. One time the children came running up to him and they're like, oh, don't touch Jesus. And he's like, suffer not the little children to come unto me. Children, women, people with disabilities, people who were sick, people who had leprosy. Everybody could approach Jesus. What an example of humility and humbleness. And he was God in the flesh. Think about it. So they continued with one accord in prayer in the upper room with the women. And Jesus' mother Mary was there and all the brethren. In, in other words, there was over 120 of them. It wasn't just the elite 11. There were 12, but one betrayed Jesus and committed suicide, which was Judas Iscariot. So it wasn't just the 11 elite that got together and prayed. It was the brethren, the women, I'm sure Jesus's family. They all continued with one accord in prayer. And then Peter being the, the Peter was the trailblazer in the bunch. He was the one that when Jesus said, do something he was like all in when jesus was on the shore and said children have you any meat he was naked put some clothes around him jumped in the water and swam all the way to shore he was like i'm on it i'm gonna get there first i'm just gonna do it the other one's got a boat and went peter was the one uh that said you know when they when they were gonna take jesus he's like jesus i'll fight for you peter was the trailblazer the just jump in and do it, don't even think about it. And then there was meek John who would just lay his head on Jesus's shoulder and say, you know, I'm going to follow you everywhere. Different, different. But Peter was the one that Jesus gave the keys to. He said, Peter, because you know who I am, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I mean, Peter was going to figure it out. Wasn't going to take time. He figured things out and just ran with it, got the keys to the kingdom. So we read in Acts, the first chapter, chapter straight away, verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, and it, and it goes to say the number and the names were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Jesus, which was guide to them. He was numbered with us. So Peter jumps up, takes the lead and says, look, I know what needs to be done. And he starts preaching to the whole group about the purpose of Jesus. I want to challenge you, read this. Read the entire chapter one of Acts. And so then Peter starts talking and they start learning about why Jesus came. So then we get to Acts chapter two and that's what I wanna talk about briefly tonight. In Acts chapter two, this is where the Holy Ghost was first poured out and that's what I'm gonna share with you tonight. Now it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, now we're talking about the 120 women, men, apostles, direct eyewitnesses of Jesus, other people, we don't even know who they were. They were all praying and, and, and verse three says, and I mean, two says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a Russian mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, 
and it's set upon each of them so the whole you know usually you've got a whole room full of people everybody's not seeing things the same way but it says and they were with one accord in one mind in one place and so when these cloven tongues like as of fire sat upon them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, hold up. Let me just lean in. Filled means there's no room for anything else. If you fill the jar, it's full. It isn't like a little bit. It's full. And they were all filled filled with the Holy Ghost. Now this Holy Ghost is kind of like wind. You can't see a Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Check this out. The Holy Ghost bypasses the mind and comes straight out of the mouth. When God's divine Holy Spirit decides that we decide we're going to let his spirit join with our spirit and become one. That's why he refers to the church as the bride of Christ, because in the beginning, God made man and woman and said, those two shall be one. It's the same way with the bride of Christ. They become one with him. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit gave them utterance. The spiritual Holy Ghost gave their mouth utterance. Just reading out the book. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. There was quite a gathering on this day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. People had come from all over the world. Now, when this was noised abroad, look, if you've got 120 people speaking in unknown languages while the Spirit's giving them the utterance and they're filled with the Holy Ghost, I mean, full of it. They're just not like a little mumble and like, okay. No, they're full of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues at a prayer meeting. I mean, there's a commotion going on. And verse six says, now when this was noised abroad, I mean, the party, the, the Holy Ghost praying party was pretty loud with 120 people. And it was so noisy that multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So God created man and created all the languages. God can speak in any language. I mean, there's so many different languages, even in the midst of some countries, there's just can be thousands of different languages. But God knows them all. So the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in their own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Are not these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, and Asia. Like there's people from all over the world there. These 120 were getting into a serious prayer meeting and Jesus told them, tarry until you are endued with my power from on high. And he told them earlier, you shall speak with new tongues, a tongue they never learned. It bypasses the mind. You know what it's about? It's about yielding your body, your mind, and your soul to the will of God. If God can control 
our tongue, the Bible says he can control all of us because the tongue is the most unruly member. We all get in trouble with our mouth, right? But it says also, in addition to Asia, it was per Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So these people that were visiting Jerusalem because of the day of Pentecost from all over the world were speaking all these different languages and this commotion comes on when God had poured out a spirit and people began to speak in tongues and it was fire. Hey, look, if anything's on fire, nobody's sitting around going, the house is on fire. The house is on fire. No, they're on fire. Okay, so it was it was a quite an ordeal. But these people said, I hear them speak the wonderful works of God. Look, I was not raised to read this Bible and to know these things. I'm here teaching not because I was raised to read it or I know it, but because I've experienced it firsthand. It's amazing. And honestly, because I'm such a, a practical person and I make checklists, it really was hard for me to comprehend that God would bypass the mind and get us to yield our body, mind, and soul to him so that he can speak and use us. It's, it's an amazing thing. And honestly, it took me a long time to be able to even grasp the thought of it, much less allow this great Holy Ghost to take my life and make something out of it. I just was a little taken aback by it all and said, I don't understand it. And it's so funny. I will, I'm good. Before I keep reading, I want to share one thing that happened to me. I, I had started going to church and I saw people receive the Holy Ghost and speak in an unknown tongue. And, and I remember one time I left the church service and I got in my car and I, and I was going home and I was like, God, this is crazy stuff. I don't get it. I think it's weird. I don't know what to think about it. And I don't think that I'm going to do that. I don't understand why you would even want me to do that. And so I got home and it was really dark and there were a lot of stars in the sky and the moon was bright and I didn't go in my house and I just sat on my porch and I just sit there, you know, kind of with my hands on my knees thinking, what did, what is this stuff? What, what, what is going on? Why am I even hearing this? And why did I see it? And God, why do you want people to do that? And, and I just don't understand. And this humble God that we serve, I'm telling you, I heard a voice as clear, like a whisper in my ear. It wasn't a loud voice. And it was, Kelly, my ways are not your ways. My ways are higher than your ways. I, I heard it. My ways are not your ways. My ways are higher than your ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth are my ways than your ways. And I sat there and I thought about that, that I heard in my ear and I was like, oh, so what God is saying is, Kelly, you're not in charge. I'm God and this is what I created and this is the way I do it. I, I got, I heard that. I mean, he, when he said to me, my ways are higher than your ways, as high as the heavens are from the earth, he was saying, hey, I don't answer to you. And I thought, then I said to God out loud, a God that I cannot see, the invisible one true God, I said, God, I don't understand it. So since your ways are higher and your words are true, could you just please help me 
to understand enough to do what you're telling me to do. I'd like to say that I had some spiritual leaders in my life that could have explained it to me better, but I didn't. I'd like to say that I had a priest or a prophet or a pastor that I could call and say, can you explain this to me? But I didn't. I didn't have those things. So if you want to know why I take time out of my schedule to teach is because maybe I can help you because I had to figure everything out on my own. And in a spiritual world where you God cannot come and appear and talk plainly to me, he can't touch me and put his arms around me and say, you know, Kelly, you're on the right track, keep going. I just wanna say now after walking with the Lord all these years, I understand that his promises are yea and amen and that he's true even though I can't see him. He's performed so many miracles in my life and given me so much peace in my life and direction. I know he's real and I know that his word is true and I'm here to share more with you. It says they were amazed and were in doubt, just like I was. Acts chapter one, verse 12 to, I mean, chapter two and verse 12 says, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? So God knew that, that people are going to doubt. You know, his ways are not openly available. He expects us to seek it and they'll be revealed to us. I, I call it concealed. You know, the ways of God are a little bit concealed because he says, whosoever shall ask, shall receive, knock, shall be opened. He wants us to seek him. So these people that heard this big noise, they didn't know what was going on either, just like I didn't know. And maybe if you're first time watching this video, you probably are thinking, I don't know either. But I'm glad you're here to learn and others mocking. Aren't there always mockers, uh, haters in the group? Others mocking said these men are full of new wine. They're acting like a bunch of drunks. So this Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues. It's not just where you stand there like this and speak in tongues. It's where you're full of God. And when you're full of God, you are a happy somebody. You know, Everything in this world kind of like that's bad for us or health wise is kind of like, sometimes I call it like a counterfeit. Like drugs and alcohol, they kind of make you feel like, oh, I don't have any cares. Um, life is just happy. I'm just feeling light. But God calls this Holy Ghost new wine where you don't have a hangover. It's not going to hurt your health. It's going to give you everlasting life. I mean, this is like total end of the spectrum, folks. But here we have our trailblazing, bold Peter. And verse 14 says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. These are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. I think it meant nine in the morning. But this is which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that it shall come to pass in the last days, we're living in the last days, people, that saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, all flesh. You know, the sons of Abraham were Jewish and Muslim. And they were the blood relation of Abraham. But from the very beginning of the Old Testament, all the way to the end, God talks about this people that's innumerable. And that's the Gentile nation. Gentiles are everybody that are not biological children of Abraham the whole world, whosoever will. 
every nation, every tongue. God said, I will pour out my Holy Spirit or spirit upon all flesh, every skin color, every dialect. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and all my servants and all my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. So then Peter begins to preach again about this Jesus and why he came to this earth and why the Jews crucified him and how the Romans were involved and how many times God had sent a prophet to tell them it was going to happen before the 400 years of silence. And then we get to um, Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 when all these people from all these nations and all these tongues were standing there and verse 37 says now when they heard this when Peter preached his message to them about everything they were pricked in their heart and they said and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do Then Peter, who had the keys to the kingdom, how to get into the kingdom of God, then Peter said unto them, repent, that means acknowledge that you have done wrong, and say, I want to turn. God, I want to follow you wholeheartedly with all of me. I want to change. It says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That meant there's no end to this. It's not like just the generation 2,000 years ago. And verse 40, and with many other words that he testify and exhort, save yourself from this untoward generation. So we're, here we have the Holy Ghost being poured out and he's telling them what they need to do. And he testified and exhorted. And it says, uh, verse 41 says, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. It's a choice on whether or not you want to receive God's word. And then, and then it goes on to say that the church was born and that they, you know, took care of each other. They parted their, their goods and, and this and that. So, so we have it here where the church is born. Now let's talk about the tongues. I want to talk about these, the tongues. Understanding the tongues. So we're going to go to... Uh, the book of Acts, starting in next week, I'm going to give you specific instances where every time or that they spoke in tongues, just like the day of Pentecost, it says, and they spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Next week, I'm going to give you live examples of people that received the Holy Ghost and how they knew it was because they spoke in tongues. I want to end with this and bring it home. I want to make it relevant. When the wind blows outside, you can feel the wind and you can see the result of the wind. You can see the trees moving. You can hear the noise. But you literally cannot see the wind going in your mouth, down into your lungs and coming back out. And Jesus compared 
the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues to the wind. He said, the wind blows where it listeth and you can hear the sound thereof. If God's spirit is going to join your spirit, you're not going to be able to see it with your eyes. So God used speaking in an unknown tongue, something that you do not know, a dialect, a, 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 a language that you never learned, that you're able to speak in that language fluently as if you were raised in it without ever learning it. And that way you will know that this unseen spirit for an invisible God is living in you. I mean, this, this is a wild moment. I'm just saying. I shared this video tonight because it was different nations coming together. Now, these are people speaking in their own dialect. And we, and we, we saw the video. But when God's spirit joins your human spirit and you allow him to, to be the ruler of your life, kingdom and ruler, when you allow him to be the ruler of your life, then how you know that you have received God's spirit is because your mouth and your tongue will speak a language that you never learned fluently. What a thought. I challenge you tonight to read this book of Acts about how this happened and understand that not only me, but you can go on to YouTube, TV channels, millions of people. I don't know. I, I don't know how many people from all nations and all tongues have experienced this God experience with the one true invisible God. And I ask you, how do you know that you're in the kingdom of God? Or the rule of God is when a change comes over your life. Ask yourself, are you ready for that change? Take time to, to seek God if you are. And tonight I want to say, I hope you, sh you tune in next week as we get in depth about the tongue part of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost or the filling or the immersion of the Holy Ghost. I want to thank you for coming. I'm going to thank you for coming and I'll see you next week.